Jesus, we thank you, God, for today. We thank you for this time that we have set apart for you. And we pray, God, that as we sing truth this morning, as we lift our voices to you, Jesus, that you would step in, um, step into this place, in this space, and do a real work in our hearts, Jesus. We look to you. We're here for you, nothing else but you, Jesus. And so be with us as we cry out to you, as we lift your name high. In your name, Jesus. Amen. It's good to have you here this morning. Let's lift our voices to Jesus and give him all the praise. Amen. Sing it with me. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met. Yeah. yeah, I was breathing, but not alive. Yeah. All my failures, I tried to hide. It was my turn. Till I met you. Right, every boy, see now. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness to your glorious day. You called my name. Every voice, nice and loud. Now your mercy has set my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old man knew, yeah. Jesus, when I met you, oh, you called. Out of the darkness into your glorious day, you call my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. heavy but chains break at the weight of your glory i need shelter i was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when i was broken you were my healing now you're Hey, good morning. Welcome. Go ahead and have a seat. 
got a few things to talk about. We got a lot going on in the life of our church right now. So one thing I'd like you to do, go ahead and look in the chair in front of you. And there should be one of these. Go ahead and pull that out just so I know that we actually have them in the chairs like they're supposed to be. Some of you are doing a great job up there pulling these out. So this is a, a QR code that you can scan with your phone. If you want to know from week to week the latest things, what's going on in the life of our church, you can scan that QR code and it will tell you all that's going on in the life of our church in the near future at least. So feel free to scan that. That also gives you a way to connect, gives you a way to give, it gives you a way to, for us to get to know you. As far as connecting goes, if you're visiting with us, whether you're a first time visitor or whether you're a long time visitor, we would love to be able to connect with you. And the best way to do that is just to text the word connect to the church number which should be on the screen. It's 972-235-5296, the number on the screen. Just text the word connect to that. That will give us a chance to connect with you, to get to know more about you, to make sure that, that we find out maybe what your needs are and how we can meet those needs. So please do that. Another way, if you are if you're already connected to our church, but you maybe you haven't found a small group yet to be in, Go by the welcome desk this morning out in the middle of the lobby. You go to the welcome desk, they've got a full list and someone can point you in the right direction of a small group that you could check out today. We've just finished up a series on like a good neighbor and about being good neighbors. And along with that, you've heard from different members of our staff. You've heard from Ron Evans, our missions pastor, about the initiative, um, that is Bless Every Home. Many of you may have already signed up for Bless Every Home. From the last couple of weeks when we started this initiative till now we're up over 200% increase in the number of people who have joined Bless Every Home. It gives you an opportunity to put your feet to your faith to pray through prayer, to pray for those that live around you. Um, it gives you reminders to pray for those around us. Sometimes I need those reminders myself. But it gives you tangibly to pray for those in your neighborhood. So please, please join that. If you have any questions about Bless Every Home and about that and how to get signed up, feel free to go to the missions table where Ron will be this morning right next to Mission Cafe. And he'll be there that can show a little bit of that to you. Um, one of the things we have coming up right now, very soon, is a sweet show. So watch this video. It'll tell you a little bit about it. It's time for our fourth annual sweet show on Sunday, October 16th. The evening features a sit-down dinner served by our students, a show from our student choir. This year, it's a tribute to the music of Walt Disney. Concluding the evening is a dessert auction. There will be silent auction items and even a live auctioneer with bidding on some amazing cakes, pies, and other culinary masterpieces. Tickets are $15 a person or a table for $125. The money raised at the Sweet Show helps our students attend D-Now camps and our choir mission trip. Get your tickets today for the Sweet Show. If you have not been to the Sweet Show in the past, you need to come. Whether you're participating or not, you need to come. It is one of the most fun events that we have all year long, multi-generational, and it really is another way that our church has done a great job of showing how much they love our students and how they want to give that way. Um, if you have some great recipe that you would like to prepare and donate to the Sweet Show for the silent auction or live auction, let me know afterwards. I'll be, there's a table out in the lobby about the sweet show. Let me know. We'll get you signed up so you can bring your award-winning dessert. It can be bid on, and the contributions will all go towards student ministry, toward our missions. Uh, join with me in prayer right now, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the way that you provide for us, for your love, for your mercy, for your grace 
for how you see our steps before us. Help us to be um, just ever listening for how you're leading us. Help us to be in the center of your will, Lord. And help us to uh, just build our lives the way that you that you would ordain it for us, Lord. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you go ahead and stand with me this morning? You know, there's something that um, some of you might know if you've been around here for a while, and some of you might not know that this room used to just be a choir rehearsal room. So a choir would come and, and rehearse and sing together. And what is actually really cool about this room is it's like designed to hear you and everyone around you sing. And, uh, you know, this morning we're keeping things simple up here on the stage. And I was just thinking how cool that we get to come together for just a little bit of time each week and we get to sing to Jesus together. We get to hear the people to your left and your right lifting up the name of Jesus. And I think sometimes it's great when we kind of simplify things. And so this morning, what I wanna encourage you to do is to just let this moment sink in, the time that you have set apart from everything else going on in your week. There's a lot of things going on in our world, in our lives, but in this moment, we get to be together as a family, the church family, and we get to sing to Jesus. And so what I wanna encourage you to do is you know, try not to just let this be something that you experience from a distance that you watch or that you see from the seat you're sitting in. But instead, what if we just said together as a family, this is like a, a worship night in the living room. This is us together just saying, Jesus, would you meet with us in this place? Would you impact me in a real tangible way? that this would be more than just church, amen? This would be a time between us and Jesus. And so if you will, just for a second, just close your eyes. And we're just going to invite the Holy Spirit to come. Holy Spirit, we invite you to have your way in us. We acknowledge that you are worthy of every breath we breathe, that you are worthy of every part of, of our heart's affection. And so I pray this morning, Jesus, that you would help us to center ourselves on you and remove every fear, anxiety, worry, distraction, every doubt. And Jesus, this morning, we would just have a sweet time with you, building up one another as we lift up your name and sing truth in this place. We love you, Jesus. We welcome you. Amen. So let's lift our voices together. Let's sing to Jesus. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Come Lord Jesus, come, lift your voice Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. All right, raise your voice, sing. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes. Worthy of all the praise we could ever read You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Yes, we live for you Jesus, the name, lift it up in this place 
Jesus' name above every other name. High above. Yeah, Jesus, the only one who could ever say. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. All right, let's join with all the angels. Sing it out. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside. Lord. 
Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Let's start. We worship. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Yes, Lord. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. We'll come to the altar. Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Will come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought. Sing it to the Lord. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Just let praise rise up from somewhere deep inside. Come on. You bow down before him. For he is Lord.
God, we believe that in this place this morning. God, how quickly it can become so commonplace for us to acknowledge that you died and rose again and are seated in the heavenly places. God, would you reawaken our first love this morning and put inside of us a hope that is bigger than our circumstances. God, put inside of us a hope that there will be a day, God, when you will wipe away every tear, when we will join with all of creation around the throne with you. And I pray, God, that the hope that we have in the risen King who has made a way for us to be seated with him forever. God, that that would awaken in us a sense of worship that's been maybe dormant in us. So God, just give us a new sense of who you are and what you've done for us, Jesus.
time, just as a choir would this morning, where we lift our voices and let's just declare that there will be a day. So let it be today that we lift a mighty roar to the King of Kings who gave us life beyond the grave. Every voice as loud as you can. So let it be today we shout with angels in the saints, we raise a mighty war. Glory to our God, who gave us life beyond the grave. Thank you, Jesus. Holy, holy is the Lord. Sing, holy, holy is the Lord. One more time, let your voice as loud as it goes. Sing. Holy, holy is the Lord. You are worthy, King Jesus. You are worthy of our praise this morning. We worship you, King Jesus, in your name. We welcome you, Jesus. Go ahead and take a seat this morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning and uh, just wonderful to worship with you. Thank you for worshiping God with all your heart, all your soul, and your mind. It's great to see you. My wife and I just spent the last uh, 10 days in, in Israel and just had an amazing time. Thank you for giving us that chance to, to take that trip. And now we're back and so excited about what God is doing. We're, we're beginning a series of sermons that actually has to do with our vision. So our vision as a church is that we say we want to be a people who are bringing healing and wholeness to our, to our world, even as we're being transformed by Jesus. Now there's two parts to that. One is that we want to bring transformation to the world. We want to bring healing and wholeness to the world. The other side of that, of course, is that we can't do that if Jesus isn't transforming us. And so we, we have this kind of sense of humility that we know that Jesus has to transform us first. And one of the, the four legs of this vision, one of the biggest ones, most important thing we realized right away is that if we're going to become a safe place for people to find healing and wholeness, if we're going to become a place where people come to be transformed, then we have to be a church that has a spirit of generosity, a, a, a people who are willing to, to just give. And I don't mean just financially, but I mean to give of ourselves, to give of our lives. When you're bringing people in and helping them to heal, it can be very messy and hard and it takes time and it takes an investment. And so that's what we talk about, the spirit of generosity. So we're gonna be talking about that next couple of weeks. And I wanna begin by going to Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 where Paul really, the entire chapter, is talking about exactly this, about the spirit of generosity in the life of the church. I want to begin by reading the first five verses. We're going to, you can just leave your Bible open to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to be looking at a lot of it. But first, let's start by reading the first five verses. And this is what the Word of God says. There is no need for me to write to you about this service to the Lord's people, for I know your eagerness to help. And I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians telling them that since last year you and Achaia were ready to give and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. But I am sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready, as I said you would be. For if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident." So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to, to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly uh, given. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You know, the Apostle Paul here, as he's writing, is on a mission. He's on, he's on this, this fierce mission that God has put in his heart to collect an offering for the Christians, the Jewish Christians living in Jerusalem. I need to give you a little bit of background because you're not gonna understand the power of what Paul is saying here about generosity unless you understand the backstory. Paul has started a group of churches in a place called Macedonia. It's this part of the world. It's considered the western part of the world. Greece is a part of Achaia. So in the in this northern part is Macedonia. In the southern part is Achaia, two districts, if you will. And Paul has started churches in 
both those areas. Uh, this, is, uh, this is on the other side of the world from Jerusalem. It's on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea, which in that day and time was the other side of the world. And, and he started these churches in places like Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. He has started those in the north and the south. It's mainly Corinth. And he's writing back to the church in Corinth, right, about this offering he wants to take up. Because what has happened is that, that Jerusalem, which is in the Holy Land, right, has experienced this famine, this, this famine, and, and famines were very common in that day and time. They would rip through the land and people would die. I mean, people would die from famines. It was, it was a serious, serious thing. It wasn't so much that they couldn't produce enough food, but like it is in most cases, even today, with famine or hunger, it's not that we can't produce enough food. It's a distribution problem, right? We can't get enough food to the right places in the world where they're suffering. And so this was the problem in that day and time. They there was plenty of food in Egypt, but they just couldn't get it to Jerusalem, right? They didn't have the money to do that. And so the Apostle Paul is going to collect this offering from these churches on the other side of the world from Jerusalem. They don't know them, but he's collecting this offering to go back and, and he's gonna hand deliver it to the Christians, the Jewish Christians living in Jerusalem. Now there's two things going on here I want you to see. There's, there's two motives going on with Paul. The first and most obvious is that he wants to help fellow Christians, right? The first and most obvious is that he just wants to have compassion and wants to help them. And that's true. But the second thing that's going on here, and maybe even the greater motivation for Paul, is that what's happening in the churches at that time is that there's this schism that is happening. There's this division in the church between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. And it's just growing and growing and growing. And the Apostle Paul is kind of the lightning rod in the middle of that schism because people are being critical of him. They think he's talking bad about the Jews. He's not. They're misunderstanding him. But they think he's talking bad about the Jews. They think he's stealing Jews, people away from Judaism to Christianity. And they're angry with him. And so he's a part of the schism that's going on. You see this division in the early Christian church and it's getting wider. And what Paul wants to do is he wants to, with this offering, see the, 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 the other reason for the offering is he wants to be able to say to the Jewish Christians living in Jerusalem, look, here are your Gentile Christians. They've collected this offering for you. See, they do love you. They do care for you. I want you to see that it's, it's not the money. It's not about the money. It's what it represents. It's not the offering itself. It's actually what the offering represents. And in this case, in Corinthians, Paul is saying it represents that the Gentile Christians really do love and care for the Jewish Christians. Don't forget that. It's what it represents, right? And what he's saying here is that he has been in these two areas. There's, remember, Macedonia in the north and Achaia in the south. And the southern churches have already pledged to give a certain amount. They haven't given it yet but they've promised they're gonna give a certain amount. And Paul is in the northern churches in Macedonia and he's trying to inspire them to give too, right? And, and he's bragging about the churches in the south saying they've already promised to give this much and he's hoping that it'll inspire the northern churches to give too and it does, it works, right? They give, they match what the southern churches have given. But now he's writing back to Corinth and the southern churches and he's saying to them, look, we're coming to collect the offering now that you promised, right? You promised to give. And he's basically saying, don't make me out to be a liar. I've been, told the, I've been telling the northern churches that the southern churches are going to do this much. And when we come, I'm hoping that you're going to be true to your word, right? And that you're going to give what you say you're going to give. And as it turns out, they did. They came through. They gave what they said they were going to give. But in talking to him about that, he gives us these, these kind of rules about the spirit of generosity. That the spirit of generosity follows certain certain rules. Uh, and, and think about it. it. Again, it's not about the money. It's about what it represents. What does, what does money represent? Think about it, right? So you go to work all week long and you, you use all your gifts, your talents, your knowledge, your, your life energy. You use all that to work in some job that you work in. And then at the end of that period, right, maybe you own your own business, but you're, you're working. And at the end of that period, whatever period it is for you, you get a paycheck, direct deposit, whatever, cash under the table. I don't know. I won't tell anybody, but I'm just saying, right? You get a certain amount of money. What does that money represent? It, it, it's a dollar sign. It's an amount, but it represents all of your life energy that week, all of your time, all of your skills, all of your efforts, all of your heart that you've poured into that work. That's what it represents, right? And, and it represents this value, it's a value proposition, you understand. It represents the value that you bring to those efforts. Now, the way that the world decides what that value is, 
is something called economics, and you, you can study it in school. I don't recommend it, but you can. Economics. I took one course in economics, right? I had to for my, my undergraduate degree. And then the, the way that the world places value on things in this economic system is um, by something called a very simple number, number one law of economics, supply and demand, right? And I know I'm oversimplifying it for you economics majors. I'm oversimplifying, but it's basically supply and demand, right? L low, low supply, high demand equals what? Value, tremendous value. If there's very little of it, it's rare, and a lot of people want it, what happens? Value increases, right? Like gold, diamonds, that's why they're so expensive because fairly rare, a lot of people want it, right? Value. People ask, why does a 24-year-old kid playing in the major playing in the major league baseball, right, make millions of dollars, and a school teacher, well, doesn't, right? And that doesn't seem right. But it's, it's the way the world places value, the law of supply and demand. The reason that 24-year-old kid makes millions of dollars is because there are very few people in the world who can hit a 95-mile-hour fastball. They're just, they're just very few who can actually hit a 95 to 100 mile hour fastball. And of those who can hit it, most of us would be jumping out of the batter's box. We wouldn't even be able to stay in the box, right? But of those who can hit it, there are even fewer who can hit it over the fence, right? Well, so what's that? Low supply, very few who can do that. And apparently there are a lot of people who want to see it happen, right? High demand, low, low supply, high demand, millions of dollars value, right? That's the way the world places value on, on the work. But what I would is it is it right? No, no, it's not right. But it's the way the world works. But not so in the kingdom of God. Here's what I want you to hear: not so in the kingdom of God. That's not the God math. That's not God economics. That's not the way God places value. God places value, inherent value, based on the image of God inside of you. You are immensely, incredibly, unfathomably valuable to God, not because of some supply and demand scale but because he loves you and he died for you and because you have the image of God inside of you, you understand? So, so I want you to, to start with that. This is where it goes. And then Paul says, here is what the spirit of generosity looks like. Understanding that, how God places value, here's what the spirit of God looks like. Let's read verses six, seven, eight, and nine. We didn't read them. Let's read them now. He keeps talking. He says, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered the gifts of the poor. Their, righteous, their righteousness endures forever, okay? So here are the rules, and they're in these verses that I just read. Here are the rules. I'm gonna just give them to you, four of them, really quickly. The first is, rule number one, is that you get what you pay for. You get what you pay for. In other words, another way of saying that is you, you reap what you sow. He, he says it there in verse, verse six. That's right out of verse six where he says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. If you are living in a spirit of generosity, then that generosity will eventually be returned to you. What goes around comes around. This is, this is the God math. This is how it, it works. Whether you want to call it karma or God's will or, or God, God's, God's plan, whatever, God's sovereignty, uh, whatever you want to call it, this is the way it works. And it doesn't make sense that the more I give, the more my heart is a giving heart, the more I receive. And again, it's not about the amount. That, that's supply and demand, okay? Put that aside. It's not about how much you give. It's about the spirit of generosity with which you live your life every day, right? I, I, I never forget the story that my friend told me. This is, this, I'm gonna tell you this, this is a true story because it sounds made up, but it's not. It really happened. A uh, pastor friend of mine, many, many years ago, he's an older pastor friend, he's retired now, uh, and he pastored at one time a church in Houston called South Main Baptist in Houston. He was pastoring that church. And they were in the middle of a building program. They were, they were trying to raise funds to improve their facilities. They were kind of an inner city church kind of situation. A lot of poor neighborhoods all around them. So they were raising funds for missions and for doing other things. 
and they were in the middle of this building program, and uh, it was a Sunday night. They used to have this thing called uh, church service on Sunday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. So this is Sunday night. It's a long time ago. And uh, they're having the worship service, and the little boy wanders into the sanctuary from, from the streets. You could tell he was from the streets. This is inner city Houston. He's kind of tattered and kind of like, looks like he hasn't taken a shower in a few weeks kind of thing. I mean, he's just, you could tell he was from the streets. And he wanders into the service and he sits in the, this pew, the satin cushion of the pew, right? And he's sitting there and people, of course, notice him. And, uh, and at one point, the offering plate is passed and the offering plate starts to come. And he's looking at the offering plate and they said his eyes are getting wide and he's fidgeting and doesn't know what to do. And so finally the plate gets to him and he accepts the plate from the usher. He holds the plate, he pulls into his pocket and he pulls out five marbles, right? And he puts the marbles into the plate and passes the plate on. And the people around him saw, you know, saw him do that and were kind of chuckling, you know, you know how cute and all that. And uh, afterwards, the, the people who were sat around him went to the usher and told him this is what happened because the usher gets the thing and there's five marbles in there, right? And it's like, they explained to him, the little boy put it in. So after the service, the usher, the head usher goes, gets the five marbles and he goes to the little boy. He's coming out. The little boy is now leaving, going back into the streets. And the usher pulls him over and says, here, son, here, here are your marbles. And the little boy looked at him and said, but I gave those to Jesus. Right? And this usher wisely, quickly recovered and said, oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, we will make sure, right, that these are used for Jesus. And he goes to the pastor, my friend, he goes to my friend, the pastor, and he hands him the marbles and he tells him the whole story. My friend, of course, thought that was so precious. And he takes the marbles to his desk. He decides he's going to keep those marbles to remember this boy, right? The next day, a man comes into the office to see the pastor. He'd been in a member of the church for a while, but hadn't been to church in a while. He was a businessman in the area, a very successful businessman. And he came to the pastor to see him urgently. And he said, I have to talk to you. And so that he made time for him. And he came in his office and said, I heard about the little boy who gave the marbles. Someone tell me the story. He said, yeah, that's right. He said, do you have those marbles? The pastor said, yeah, I've got them right here. He pulls out the marbles. And the man explained to him, I have not been coming to church. I've been struggling in my life. I've been drifting away from God. And I've heard that story. And God moved me in that story. I want to buy those marbles from you for $20,000 a marble, right? To give to the building fund. And my pastor said, yeah, you can have the marbles, right? I was going to keep them, but hey, $20,000 a marble I want to give. It's not about how much. It's those who sow sparingly reap sparingly. Those who sow generously reap generously. And it's not the dollar amount. That's, that's the world stuff. That's the supply and demand thing. No, no, it's about this spirit of generosity. That's the first rule of the spirit of generosity. The second rule is verse seven. And that is that the cheerful giver is the independent giver, right? Is the one who gives out of their own desire to give. Verse seven, he says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, not, not, not because we're manipulating you or, or guilt shaming you into, into this. No, no, that defeats the purpose. He says, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, the thing you have to understand is that these people living in Macedonia and Achaia and that part of the world, they didn't have a lot of money. Money was, not, it, money was hard to come by. People dealt in that world through bartering system. I'll give you this chicken for those whatever, right, will trade. They, they grew their own, their own food, right, in the, in the backyard, little gardens. Where they didn't have a lot of actual money to give. They didn't have much. So this is why Apostle Paul says, whatever God has placed on your heart to give, whatever it is. And if we have to manipulate you and twist your arm, then it defeats the purpose, my wife and I, a lot of years ago, read a book. It's an old book, but a very famous book called The Five Love Languages, right? And it talks about the different ways in, in a marriage or any relationship that we hear, I love you, right? Uh, the, you know, uh, words of affirmation, uh, gifts, right? Physical touch, uh, um, acts of service. I can never remember the fifth one, but anyway. Huh? Quality time. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's not my love language. That's probably why I always forget it, but anyway. So my wife, you take this test, right, and figure out which one's, which one's your wife's and, or your husband's, and you try to, then you try to, to say I love you in that language, right? 
my language, my love language is physical touch, right? Yeah, baby, right? Okay, so that's my love language. I'm such a guy. Anyway, physical touch. My wife, her love language is acts of service. She doesn't care about gifts. She doesn't care about, she's like, what have you done for me lately, baby, right? Acts of service. So for me, if I want to say I love you to my wife, what do I do? I wash the dishes, right? Which doesn't happen very often, but... But it, the, the, the key to all of it, though, is that it has to be voluntarily, right? If my wife is complaining and telling me, wash the dishes, wash the dishes, wash, and I finally go, okay, I'll wash the dishes, and I go, no, 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 that's, that, it doesn't work that way. I'm not saying I love you. I'm saying I'm giving in because you're nagging me, right? No, it has to be my idea. So I come to her and I say, sweetie, it's been a long day, and I know you're tired. Let me take care of the kitchen, right? Oh, man, right? What did I just say? In her language, just said, I love you, right? I'm getting physical touch tonight, baby, because I just said, I love you, right? That's the way it works. But it has to be voluntarily. <laughs> Did you just gross out about your pastor saying he's getting physical touch? Right, that doesn't, no, that's wrong. That's just wrong. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The cheerful giver is the independent giver. Free will is an essential element component to love. You cannot have love if you don't have free will. You cannot have love if, the, if said love is being coerced or manipulated or demanded. No, it doesn't work that way. Love demands free will. To, to be a, a generous spirit demands that I'm doing it freely, right? Because I want to. Okay, that's the second rule. The third rule. The third rule is that the one who gives freely is blessed by God. The one who gives freely, he says, is blessed by God. Verses eight and nine, he says, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work, right? God is able to bless you. The one who gives freely is blessed by God. I don't know, I don't understand how that works or why that works. All I can tell you is that I know from experience that it works. It just absolutely works. Look, I took advanced mathematics on my way to an engineering degree. Um, so I understand math. I don't understand God's math. I cannot explain it to you. It makes no sense. It doesn't work like accounting math, right? This math says that the more you give, the more you're blessed. The more you push away from yourself, the more you're blessed. The more you give to others, the more you're blessed. And it doesn't make any sense. The more you empty your cup, the more you empty your coffers, the more you are blessed. This says you cannot outgive God. Cannot outgive God. There's an old preacher that was actually a, a somewhat instrumental in my early formations as a preacher and a, as someone who's feeling called by God when I was in my 20s and was considering ministry. A man named Tony Campolo, you may have heard of him, and he was this fantastic, brilliant, brilliant guy and, and, a, and a preacher and a teacher. And, uh, but he, I'll never forget a story he tells about, about this, where he was, he, was a young, he was a young preacher, young teacher. He was also teaching at a college, and the, he and his wife didn't have much money. They just had their first baby. And the missionary came to him and said, hey, uh, can you support my mission work, right? And Tony Campolo felt the Spirit of God leading him to, to, to do that, but he just didn't have a lot of money. So he put a case out, I'll give you, I'll give you $100 a month. That's all I can do. He says, but there's a caveat. I will give you $100 a month until the tires on my car wear out because his tires were like, he was needing new tires on his car already, right? And he's thinking, oh, so the tires are gonna wear out. Once my tires on my car wear out, then I'm gonna have to divert that money to, the, to that and, and do that, but I'll, until then I'll give. And so he was giving monthly and he was going about traveling everywhere, talking and speaking and doing what he did. And his tires were getting, of course, thinner and thinner and thinner. And finally, he drives up to this one church where he's gonna preach that night. Uh, he's gonna preach something called a revival meeting, uh, Google it. And uh, he's gonna preach. And so he gets out of his car and he sees the tires. He goes, these, they are like, they're bald, right? You can see the, this, these tires. Tomorrow, I'm gonna stop giving the missionary and I'm gonna go get new tires. And he preached the service. And after the service, the pastor greeted him at the door. He said, Tony, thank you. You're such a blessing tonight. I have a special surprise for you. And he took him out to his car and he looked at the car and he had four new tires on his car, brand new tires. And the guy said, one of our deacons went by and saw your car and how bald your tires were and that's what he does for a living. And he, free of charge, you have these four new tires, right? And Campola's going, 
you don't know how much this is costing me, right? <laughs> you have no idea how much this is costing me. You can't outgive God. You, you, just, you just can't. It's like the, the more you give, the more you receive, the more your spirit. Again, don't think just money, your time, your love, your care, your investment in people. It always comes back to you. The one who freely gives is blessed by God. And then the fourth rule, the last rule, and that is that the spirit of generosity is a testimony uh, of, of the love, to the love of God. That, that there's something else going on here. Paul says there's something else going on here when you give, the way you give and the, the generous way you give. What's going on here is that your giving is a testimony to all the people who see you giving, right? It's a testimony to, to, to the love of God in your heart. What, what, what your giving does when you're giving and you're giving and you're giving, it, it screams to everyone all around you to the love and grace of God in your, in your life. Look at what he says in verse 10, uh, in 11, 10, 10 to 15. He says, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Look at verse 12. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. People are watching you and they're thanking God for you. Verse 13, because of the service by which you have proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. People are gonna see it and they're gonna praise God and in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. This is a gift and it's not about what the money is going to buy. This is a gift because every Everyone sees the love of God in your giving. People see the love of God in you and God is praised and God is glorified. Now listen, I know that the history of the church um, has its dark side. There is no doubt this dark side to the history of the church. When you study Christianity and you study how the church grew and the persecution and I don't, mean, I don't mean the world persecuting the Christians, I mean Christians persecuting other Christians just because they don't think alike, right? The Inquisition, the Crusades, people like Huss, who was one of the great reformers of the church, was burned at the stake for his beliefs. Witch trials, on and on and on we could go, right? In some ways, in some ways the church in Europe fostering the rampant anti-Semitism that was found in Europe before, before Hitler came along. Right? Hitler did not happen in a vacuum. There was a rampant anti-Semitism throughout all of Europe at that time, partly due to what the church was preaching. So I know that there's this dark side to the church. I know that. That's because there's this dark side to the human heart. The church is made up of human beings, right? Human beings, and there's this dark side to the human heart that's always difficult to deal with, right? So yes, there's this dark side to the, to the history of the church, but I also want you to see that there's this amazing, brilliant light. When you study the history of the church and the way the church formed, the things that the church has done, there's this brilliant light as Christians, millions of Christians throughout the centuries all over the globe have given and given and given and given their very lives to the, to the cause of the gospel. And you see light everywhere, orphanages and hospitals and, and institutions of, high, of education and, and feeding the poor. And, and wherever there's a disaster, you find the Christians. Wherever there's a hurricane, you find the Christians. Wherever there's a tornado, you find the Christians. Wherever someone is hurting and in pain and lost and suffering and, 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 and can't get through what you find there. Go to that dark, dark place and you find God, but you also find some Christian, amen? Holding a hand, shedding some kind of light in that dark situation. And, and here's this, what Paul calls that, this thing that I just described that you can actually track throughout the centuries through the, with the church, this thing, what Paul calls that is this indescribable gift. It is an indescribable gift to the world. It is our testimony to the world. My last church, we were very active in missions in Africa, and we were in Kenya. So I, I went with the group to Kenya, and I, we landed in Nairobi. 
And we were working with several churches in that area. And I was doing a conference. They asked me to teach at this conference there in Nairobi, pastors, a bunch of pastors. So we taught, did this pastor's conference. I taught. Afterwards, a, a pastor came up to me, African pastor came up to me and, and, and started talking to me. And he, he had very good English. And he said that, he, he told me his story, that he had been uh, the son of a witch doctor in Maasai tribe. He's part of the Maasai tribe. And his father had been the kind of the witch doctor of the village and how God had transformed his life and he had shared with his father and his father was transformed and the whole family became Christians. Incredible story. And that he's now pastoring this church outside, right outside of Nairobi. He says, I, I want to take you to my church tomorrow. I'm going to come pick you up at the hotel. Like, I don't know who this guy is, right? I've never met him before. And I'm in Nairobi. I've never been to Nairobi before, right? I just know that when we drove up to the hotel, there were like chain fences with the barbed wire, you know, it's like, like to protect the hotel, <laughs> And guys with big guns walking around, right, to protect the hotel. I've never been there. But, and this guy I don't know, say, I'm going to come pick you up. He says, okay, Lord Jesus, please help me. I, 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 okay. So he does. He comes and picks me up in the morning. We, drives me out. He and, he and one of his deacons drives me out to their church. And when we get to their church, I'm thinking, okay, thank you, Jesus. I was the preacher. They're going to take me out into the woods and kill me, right? Because I didn't know them. So, but they, they take me to the church, and we have this worship service. And they're giving me a place of special honor right next to the, the stage, uh, where I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there, a place of honor because I'm pastor from the United States. That's the only reason. Uh, and um, and the, the worship service is amazing. It's amazing. First of all, I drive up and it's a caliche parking lot, but there are no cars. And the deacon who had a car, he parked the car and got out. And it's a good sized caliche parking lot right in front of the, the building that, where they were worshiping. And I said, where are all the cars? And he said, oh, this is the only car in the church, in the whole church. This man is the only one who owned a car. Everyone walks from 15, 20, sometimes 30 miles away, they walk to church, right? No one else has a car. So this is obviously, he says, most of, most of the people live on $1, one American dollar a day, right? They make $365 a year if they're lucky. And that's what they live on, right? So we're, we're doing the service. Uh, the offering time came for the service, right? It was offering time. And the way they did it is they had these buckets up at the front, right, kind of brass, and, um, and they were playing music, and you imagine music is very lively, and so people are dancing around, they're having, and they're coming up, they come up to put their offering in the, in the plate, in the, in, the, in the little bowls, right, brass, brass buckets. And they're coming up, and they're doing this, and they're putting it in, they're going, and they're, they're all doing this and going back, and they're coming up, and they're just lively. I mean, they're dancing, and they're putting it in, and they go back. They'll come up, they'll come up, and they'll put it in, and then they'll go back. And I'm sitting there watching it, because I'm right by the bucket. I'm like, this is awesome. This is amazing. And then I, I realize, I look closely, and I realize most of them were not putting anything in the bucket. They didn't have anything in their hands. They were just coming up and doing this. And there was, nothing, there was nothing in the bucket. They didn't have anything in their hands. And I thought, that's strange. Like most of them were not putting anything in. And I thought, well, this is just kind of, this is just for show. And then I realized, culturally, right? I realized how important that was for them. A testimony. They didn't have anything. They're living on a dollar a day. They literally didn't have anything to put in the bucket, but it was vitally important to them that they showed this public testimony of, I want to give, right? I want to give. This is the spirit of generosity. It's not about how much. It's not about, about you or me. It's not even about money. It really is about what it represents in your heart and in mine. We want to be a church that is super generous with our hearts and our lives to create a safe place for, so that people can find healing and wholeness for their lives. And we understand that being a generous church is the first step. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace and your love and all that you give us. We pray now that you would bless us as we go from this place. Help us to live for you every day. Help us to love you with our whole hearts, with everything we have. Help us to be so generous to you because you are so generous to us. For God so loved the world that he gave, he gave his one and only son, 
Jesus, and we don't ever want to forget your generosity. Help us to love you the same exact way. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us in worship today. I pray that God has blessed you in a special way, and I can't wait to see you again next Sunday.